Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Journey to the Pit. I'm Jim Collins, and uh, we have uh, we're starting another session today. Uh, this is the next episode. We have a special guest coming on tonight, like we do every week at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we got uh, Clark is uh, coming on in here, but I'm glad y'all guys are here. Let me go ahead and bring our special guests in. Uh, just to let y'all guys know, as we start out there, that all the information discussed in this video is for educational, historical, entertainment purposes only. None of this information is intended for any illegal purposes. All opinions are respective of the individuals. Clark, how you doing? Welcome to the show. Uh, glad to have me, brother. Uh, just doing good. Just been uh, working hard today, rotating a bunch. Never enough time in the day, you know. That's how it is. That's how it is. I see we got a lot of viewers already checking in. Guys, if y'all could just uh, let us know that if the sound is good on both ends and uh, the video was clear, that'd be great before we get too deep into it. But it looks like I can tell you one thing, Clark, man. This, your your, your uh, interview today has probably uh, had about the most sign-ups uh -huh. um, at, 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 out of all the interviews that we have had so far. And granted... You know, uh, as we do it week after week after week, we get more people that 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 learn about the uh, you know journey to the pit thing every week, right. and uh, which is great. But yeah, I think it's probably over about three hundred people <laughs> that signed up tonight, man. So a lot of guys are are looking forward uh, to this session tonight, uh, this episode. So let's go ahead and get started. You know, um, one, you know, like I I will typically ask kind of the same questions to get different perspectives okay. from different people and uh and tonight we want to kind of do the same thing so let's just start from the beginning okay. what even got you into game foul how old were you well i mean i was born into it pretty much you know my father really liked him I mean, he was pretty much a breeder you know and then uh, my grandfather you know was a gambler fighter you know at the pit you know friday saturday sunday you know when everything was still illegal and and right. you know i pretty much just grew up with game chickens you know my whole life and um, you know, it's been, you know, since day one, you know, so. Okay. So, so Clark, tell me this, uh, are you, are you, are you still based in Texas? Have you always lived there? Oh, look like the video froze up a little bit. Guys, give us a second. Look like, uh, Clark's video froze up just a second. You know, we're dealing with, uh, just hold on and give us a minute. It should come right back on in. Man, week after week after week, man, we freezing up. I don't know what the deal is. But, guys, y'all already know, we still going to make the best out of it like we do week after week after week. We're going to get Clark back on in here. Here he comes now. We already know we have a few little technical difficulties. But no worries. We always make the best of it. And uh, if y'all guys are just joining us, we got Clark. So, Clark, go ahead. And um, it, it froze up a little bit. But you know what, man? We deal with some type of technical difficulty. Every I have day. somebody There's call no me right worries. now. Let's just go ahead and keep it well, moving. I had a phone call. <laughs> I, I, hit, I had to shut it off real quick. So, okay. But, uh, so, so, so where are you based out of, Clark? Uh, I'm in El Paso, Texas. Uh, I was actually born and raised in Kentucky, and then uh, I joined the Army in 2007. And then uh, I was based here at uh, – they sent me to Fort Bliss, Texas here. Okay, okay, okay. All right, so, so tell me something. Obviously, when you enroll into the military, one, I want to definitely thank you for your service, and I think everybody's watching will also like to thank you for your service to this country. So – you know, what, what, what I would like to also talk about, too, which I think is very important, is with you enrolling into the military, how did that affect your life as far as dealing with the game foul? Obviously, you had to step away from it, or how did that Well, work? I mean, uh, during basic training, you know, I was uh, – uh, they sent me to uh, um, Fort Benning, you know, and I was there for four months. And then, obviously, you know, I mean, I, no phone calls, no TV, you know, nothing, just training hard. You know, learning what we, you know, learning the craft. And, then, uh, you know, I was away. You know, my brother was taking care of my brood fowl. You know, I pretty much, I just sold all the all the cross stuff, you know, so it'd be real, real easy on him to take care of. And uh -huh. then, uh, you know, I just kept, uh, uh, you know, all my brood fowl that I needed. And then, you know, once I uh, graduated basic training, you know, I found out where my duty station was going to be. 
And then uh, once I got settled in here a couple weeks, I had them sent to Texas. Okay, okay. So you kind of relocated. So you basically, after that training, you basically just went ahead and relocated to yeah, Texas. Yeah, well, huh? I mean, uh, about a week before you graduate basic training, they tell you, you know, where, you know, where in the world you're going, you know. And, uh, uh, a lot of my friends was going to Italy and Germany, and I was like, oh, man, no, you know, no chickens, no roosters allowed over there. Or nobody's <laughs> got them or anything. And then uh, right. uh, once I found, you know, uh, found out I was coming to uh, El Paso, Texas, I said, well, one good thing about it, you know, I said, uh, there's a lot of Mexicans, so there's going to be uh, the, the, you know, plenty of roosters to uh, be involved with. So I was very, I fit in very, very well here, you know. That's great, man. That is great. That's awesome. So, so tell me, Clark, uh, the when you say about the brood foul, was the brood foul or the line that you started with carry over from your father? Well, uh, most of my bloodlines, like my Kelso, my regular gray, and my roundheads, come from Decox uh, in Bama Sports, uh, Mike and Jimbo. Uh, I acquired those in '96 because. Me, I was, when it was legal, you know, I was always a long knife, short knife type guy. My grandfather, you know, they all grew up in the, you know, in the spur. So, you know, I kind of translated, you know, and got away from the, uh, the hatches and the hatch grays, the old slow, you know, hit me hard, you know, and just trade licks. So, I mean, it was just a different kind of competition when I started, you know, ex you know, going to Sunset, the Bayou Club, and just, you know, uh, fighting at the toughest levels, you know, I mean, I really had to uh, get out there and, and find some chickens that was, you know, capable of getting the job done. Uh, right. the, the other two bloodlines that I have, I have, also have the Colonel Givens Hatch and then uh, the cleric uh, that was uh, with my partner here that I teamed up with. That was his two bloodlines that he carried. Okay, okay, okay. So, so actually, you kind of like – even though you come second generation, actually you still had to uh, kind of start over because you had to go a little different direction with the birds, right? right? Well, I mean, like I said, the, everything was going toward, you know, back, like I say, when it was legal, everything was going toward the short knife. And, you know, I was I was really into that, you know. I mean, that that was my weapon. And, and, and you know, still is today. You know, we travel to Mexico all the time. And, and, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, I'm actually going over there tomorrow, you know. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know, Mike and Jimbo and D and they and you know Miss Jenny, you know they really uh, um, you know hooked me up with some you know outstanding fowl that's still winning today. Still winning today. Still winning today. And we're going to get into your international travel as we get on in the interview okay. because I think the guys would definitely like to know you know what is the difference. Um, um, and I'm I'm sure it's some type of difference because you know geographical difference, temperature difference, yeah. you know, and that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Um, so, so let's just talk a little bit more because I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, what, what, what characteristics were you looking for back in the day when it was legal that made you transition to um, um, a bird that suited the weapon that you were showing at that time? Was it different characteristics that you were looking for? Well, I mean, like I said, me and my grandfather used to travel a lot and, you know, we'd go to Sunset and, you know, Bayou Club and, you know, uh, Del Rio, plenty of different, you know, places across the country. And then uh, uh, I watched Jimbo. He was pitting some of those pure roundheads, you know. And then uh, I was like, man, these are, you know, they're high flying. They're smart. You know, th these are the kind of type of roosters that I want, you know. And right. then uh, later on, you know, I gave him a call. And then, uh, um, you know, they, they, you know, D was trying to tell me, hey, you know, you, you need to breed these Kelsos into the roundheads and the, the Kelso grays. And, you know, just, they was just telling me, you know, uh, uh, how to breed them and, and what to look mm -hmm. out for mm -hmm. and, you know, and just uh, so on, you know. Okay. So, so Clark, tell me something. With, with, with that being started, so now you got your start as far as knowing where your source of birds are going to have to come from to go into the direction that you're uh -huh. going. How long did it take you to kind of get them to the way you like them? Well, the, the Kelso's was a little bit mean when I got them. You know, uh, the, actually, the, the, the brood cock that I got, I don't know if just because, well, you know, we bred him and he turned out mean, but he was an outstanding rooster, you know, sparring, super athletic, so on. So, you know, after that, you know, I wanted to pick out, you know, uh, uh, a stag that was, you know, a lot more gentler than he was, you know, just, uh, you know, have a little bit better disposition than what his daddy did. So, you know, that had pretty much improved the Kelso's. 
And then Way D and Jimbo always explained them to me. He always told me, he's like, look, this Roundhead and Kelso family, you always want to breed them back and forth into each other. You know, you breed the Kelso into the Roundheads and then breed it all the way back out. And then the, and the Roundheads and the Kelso is the same way. So, you know, I mean, that's been over 20-something years ago. And to tell you the truth, I think they're getting better than, than they was when I got them. So I don't know if I got wow. lucky or, or what. Well, it seemed like you followed direction and and, 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 and followed the method that they said would probably yield the best right. results. So, I mean, pretty much all I know. So, Clark, tell me something. You know, I listened to the man that bred them, you know, and I think that's the uh, a big a mistake to a lot of people. You know, the, you, you, you'll go and see somebody doing really, really well, and, you know, you, you try to you know, make it different or change it up from what, the, you know, you've seen for many years. I mean, if it's work, I mean, if it works, you know, don't – if it's not broke, don't fix it. You know, right. That's right. That's right. So, so that's that. That makes a lot, a lot of sense because, like you said, a lot of times the first thing guys want to do is they'll they'll see something that they like, and then as soon as they get it, they put a spin right. on it, and it's like, well, you know, you got it, you you, you got it because you like right. it. Now you now you now you have it. You went out there and got it because you like what exactly. you see. Now you have it. Now you want to put a spin on it. So it's almost like. You know, did you did you feel as though uh, they were complete? I mean, from looking at them, they were what you needed, yes, right? Sir. And you just kind of want to continue on what was already. Yes, sir. Needed. All I done was just I done what D and Jimbo and my, you know, they, you know, they what they told me to do. And like I say, I mean, they, these guys has been in the business for you know 30, 40, 50 years. You know, their daddy. I mean, you know, me as a little young punk at the time, I think I was like thirteen or fourteen years old. So you know. I, just wow. uh i'm glad i listened to them and you know bred them the way that i needed to and you know and over the years you know i've picked you know maybe uh um, you know a little bit maybe a different color or something like that you know i've just made them my own you know I, mine look a little bit different from the ones that they have now so but it's just all in the eyes of the beholder you know you 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 like them a little taller darker lighter and then uh like i say i just went you know and picked out whatever i thought was the best and breed it to the best Right. So that's great. So that, that leads us into the next question. What, what are some of the characteristics you look for to make a breeding decision? Well, first of all, I, I don't like a mean rooster. You know, if, he, if okay. he'll hit you or, or just, you know, he wants to bite on you a little bit or something. You know, if he's got a bad disposition, I just immediately, I don't care how athletic he is, how nice he is, I'll throw him out. And, you know, uh, okay. a lot of people, they forget about the hens. You know, I'm a big believer in just sitting back and picking good quality hens, feminine hens, which I like my hens to have spurs, you know. So, uh, oh, okay. yeah, I mean, it's uh, – I think it's just um, – th they throw better stags, in my opinion, you know. Um, I'm just really, really picky on my hens. They, I mean, they they, they got to be perfect in every way, you know, the, the – you know, their stance, the way they conduct themselves, the way they walk, you know, the, the right. eyes have to be perfect. But, uh, you know, I think a lot of beginners, you know, they, they or, or a lot of people, you know, they go straight out for just a beautiful cock and they don't care what the hens look like. But uh, I'm just right. a big, big believer in the hens. Well, that I have to agree with you a thousand percent on that. And I know if a lot of guys follow my social media, I definitely focus a lot on the hens. Um, and one of the reasons is I see so many people pay no mind right. to them. You know, everybody's so focused on just the cock and not the hen. And to me, that that never made any right. sense. Well, you gotta uh, have, it's two parts to it. The anyway. cock has got to be perfect so, also. You know, I mean, he's got to, you know, uh, just different things that, you know, each different person looks for. You know, you might like a little taller rooster or a medium station rooster or whatever the case may be. But, uh, you know, it, the, the cock has got to be athletic. I mean, he's got to have all, you know, he, you know he's, he, he's got to have all the, you know, he's got to check all the marks too, you know. So, um, and the brood pens is the heart of you know, any game, I mean, any farm. You know, if, you, if your brood pens are not good, you're not going to be successful in any other aspect of the game. I mean, that's just the bottom line. You know, and a lot of people, they like to go out and, you know, they be cheap and spend $50 on a rooster, and then they think they're going to come out and compete against, you know, people that's, you know, uh, had their own line of roosters for 30 or 40 years. You know, it's, it don't right. work that way in this game. But and you might get lucky, but, 
spend good money on chickens, pay the man for his money, you know, whatever he says they're worth. And, you know, I mean, and, and then breed them the way he tells you to first. If you don't like them, then change them then. But, you know, uh, when you're going out, and a lot of beginners, you know, when they're, when they're going out and purchasing fowl, they just go straight to the Internet or they don't go out and watch them perform in Mexico or Philippines or whatever. You, you right. go right. watch the guy perform for six months or a year, you know, before you even buy the chickens. You know, that way, you know, if it's that, you know, if it's your cup of tea, you know, then you can go ahead and buy them. And, you know, that saves you a lot of mo time and money when you go and watch him perform. You know, that's on his dollar, you know. That's right. That's right. So that's and, and you know that you made some you made some very valid points. One, definitely pay the man what he says his birds right. are worth. You know, nobody can't put a price on another man's birds. I don't care if the next guy is selling a round head for 175 and this guy say 400 You can't never say, well, I can get that round head from this dude for what yeah. You can never do that. That's number one. You can't do it. But also, too, I think what is probably one of the most important things is if you decided to purchase the birds from that particular person is because of what you've seen you right. like, why don't you listen to the way he tell you to breed them? That's what I don't understand. I mean, that's, I mean, if you if you liked it and you went there to purchase those birds because you seen what you mm -hmm. like, why do you bring them straight home and go the total different direction? I don't understand it. You know, and like I say, if if they don't turn out the way that you like or whatever the case may be, then you can start you know start tweaking with them, but. You know, I can't, you know, uh, express enough, you know, to, you know, how thankful I am, you know, for, you know, Mike and Jimbo and Dee and Jenny, you know, from Bama Sports Farms, you know, I mean, they, you know, they, they started me off in the right way. And, you know, I have, I've had a lot of people, you know, it's been, uh, uh, you know, mentors and stuff to me over the years and, you know, just everything clicked the right way with the chickens that I got from them. And, you know, and thank God I've been able to keep them, you know, good or, or you know, just as good as or better than they was. Right. right. That's right. That's right. So, so Clark, tell me something. How important, not only through a genetic standpoint, but how important is the selection process as far as the importance of your breeding program? You know, because you got to hatch. You know, you hatch some out. You got five stags. They all, you know, hatch brothers. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean all of them are going to produce the same. So what type of things do you, do you take into consideration to determine, you know, which ones you're going to be breeding out of that. Well, day. first of all, uh, usually I'll keep, you know, three to five brothers of each bloodline and, you know, probably eight to ten sisters of each of the bloodline. And then, um, you know, I'll, I'll set, I'll single mate those, you know. And then once, you know, two years down the road, you know, when I show them, you know, in Mexico or Philippines or wherever I take them to, you know, I'll keep close records of, you know, which one is doing the best. Okay, this hen's producing, this cock's producing, you know, and it's super, right. super hard to get a cock that throws outstanding chickens. You know, it, it's hard to get a producer. Not just any cock that you throw in the damn brood pan is going to be a producer. <laughs> and it's usually the one, not, it's usually not the real beautiful one that stands out of the whole bunch that we all tend to, uh, you know, tend to gravitate gravitate towards but uh, I keep close records of everything and then I'll set that brood pen up I think to me which a lot of people like to breed you know stags or two-year-old chickens I think that they're the best from three to six years old uh, as far as producing mm. stags you know the quality of stags maybe you know the sperm count goes down or whatever the case may be but the quality of stags is better from three to six year old brood fowl uh, in my opinion Wow, that's 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 actually the first time we had some of that. That's some great, that's a great perspective. So you 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 kind of like the results you're getting um, from from the cocks between the three and six year old range. Even huh? even the even the hens. Uh, I don't know if it's just this climate where I'm at here in the desert. Um, you know, of course, ever every place is different. You know, I mean, like my farm in the Philippines. You know, even a six or a seven year old rooster's got beautiful feet. You know, the you know there's plenty of moisture there. The feathers stay real, real good. Uh, they, you know, it's just I guess it just depends on where you're at. But uh, I mean, right. in right. in my previous experience, uh, uh, the percentage is the highest at three to six years old. Wow! 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 So you figure, yeah. So 
So so that's from boy, you know, that's some really good information. So the older it seems like you get, you said his sperm count might drop a little, but the but the percentage of high quality stags he's producing seems to be more consistently better between the three and six. Yeah, and they're more they're more uniformed. Uh, I like to say the cock will get bad before the hens do usually, you know. Um, but like I say, a three to six year old hen is perfect to me, you know. Um, you know, that's just my opinion. A lot of people might, you know, like to breed younger stuff, but you know, that's just what I've had success with. That's right. That's right. So, so, so tell me that the next question that I want to talk about, because like you said, it depends on the climate. Is it, is, have you seen a difference in your birds from, you know, when you lived in Kentucky versus Texas? Oh yeah. I mean, you know, in Kentucky, you know, they got, uh, beautiful uh, black dirt, you know, the soil's real rich, uh, green grass, plenty of bugs to eat. You know, here in the desert, we have to, you know, I pretty much raise them in a, in a, in a, a range that's enclosed, you know, and they only get, what I, you know, what I feed them. But, uh, you know, like, say, my farm in the Philippines, you know, where they can free range, you know, I think that, you know, of course, I think they're going to be better. But, you know, you just have to make the best out of the location that you're at. You know, I mean, every farm is different, and, you know, everybody can't do the same thing. So you just have to get, you know, the, the best out of what you got. That's right. That's right. And you're right. That, that, and, and that makes a lot, of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of sense because the climate, the geographical area is definitely going to affect uh, the birds because, you know, you have some rays in Kentucky, you have some rays in right. Texas. But like you say, some rays outside on black dirt, and then the other one is rays. Uh, with only the things that you're yeah, able to feed them. So that, that actually have goes to, to my next question. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We don't have, no, I mean, here in the desert, it's nothing but sand. So, you know, obviously the better climate and the better dirt and everything you got, you probably get a little better chicken. But, you know, like I say, you just have to adapt to what you got because, you know, not everybody lives in beautiful, you know, uh, green rolling hills, you know. That's, no, that's... <laughs> So, Clark, tell me this, though. So, and I don't want to jump ahead because I still come want to talk. So, we're going to get back to that, that, that because I think that aspect right there, you have real-life experience from living and starting off in a place with really green, rich soil and, and, and grass right. to being out in the desert, still just as successful from there to there. So, I think, you know, in a, in a minute, I want to talk about, you know, feeding aspect. Uh -huh. But before we get to that, do you use incubators or natural hatch? Well, I, I mean, I, I play so many, you know, in Mexico and Philippines and everything. I fight so many over there that I have to use an incubator. But if I had my choice, I would try to hatch them all out with hens. But it's just so, you know, time consuming. You can't get them all the same age. You know, it's just not worth it. So I, I hatch everything out of incubators. Okay. I hatch everything out of incubators. Okay. And, 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 and. Clark, how much would you say? How many would you say you hatch per year? Uh, I'm hatching close to five hundred, between five and six hundred a year here in the states, and I'm hatching probably another five to six hundred in the Philippines. Okay, 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 and 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 so the next deal is okay. Can you give us say you know the program you kind of run here for the first three months of uh, of uh, you know once once the the biddies are hatched. You know, can you give us like a little quick rundown or summary how you kind of run your program for the first couple months? Yeah, well, right here in Texas, uh, like I say, the first day we'll, you know, we'll uh, um, vaccinate for Merck's, you know, on the first day. Um, I use a lot of Filipino products, like the, the vaccinations I get from, the, you know, just the local feed store here. And then uh, the, really the only two problems that I have around this area is Merck's or, or chicken pox. So that's pretty much it all I vaccinate for, you know, in my area because – I'm not a seller. You know, I'll sell a few chickens here and there to maybe some friends or family or something like that. But pretty much everything that I raise is for me and, you know, the, in, in my area. So uh, once okay. they get about six weeks old, I'll vaccinate for the pox. And then uh, I run uh, uh, Vitamin Pro in their water. It's just a multivitamin. You know, it's a water soluble, you know, that I get from the Philippines. Uh, and then uh, they also have like an antibiotic that I run in the, in the, in the water. It's a Promoxil 550. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, like I say, just good feed and good water every day. And, you know, you can't, uh, uh, I can't make it, I can't stress enough of how good, good, clean water is. You know, that, that, that's one thing that really irks me when I go to somebody's house, you know, and 
they're sitting there bragging on the roosters and, and they either have no water or it's black water or, or green. You know, I mean, I can't stand it. I'll just start cleaning water bowls. I mean, some people, are, hey, man, you know, this is not even my place and you're going to hear water in my chickens, you know, but, uh, especially here. You know, and, yeah. we, and we're going to get to that part because it is a, it's a couple of things and I'm kind of, I'm kind of like trying to stay on track so we can get some solid information because I know we only got a, about an hour right. and it's a lot of information we need to try to get in. But we're going to come back to that with these dirty water bowls and all that. You know, some guys out here think it doesn't make yeah. a difference. I'm here to tell you, it makes a difference. And about five or six years ago, I wrote an article and, and posted it about the effects of, of oh, water. Oh. You know, and, and some guys argue with me about it. And I said, listen, this is scientific evidence. I'm telling you, clean water makes a yeah, difference. I mean, period. that's just, uh, that, that's the bottom line. You need, you got to have, I mean, that's, that's life, you know? That's right. That's right. That's right. That's life. So, so tell me, Clark, uh, you know, do you free range your birds? Or Here where I'm at, I got a, a small, two small places. Uh, I have one acre at one place and an acre at another place. So, uh, I can't, fr well, I mean, it's sort of semi free range. Uh, I have big nets up and everything. They can, you know, they, they've got about maybe three quarters of an acre to run around where they need to. And I've got it sectioned off for different age groups. Uh, okay. like I said, I don't have a real, real big place here, so they can't, you know, that's as good as I can uh, provide for them. And actually it's been working. Yeah. So if anybody doubted, they know they, they, they must just don't right. know. Uh, so, Okay, so so we got the semi free range. So, do you have your birds on, or do you prefer tie cords over pins, or do you use? Well, both? I think you got to have a combination of both. You know, uh, especially you know during the keep. You know, I like to rotate my you know my roosters out on the tie cords for a little green grass. Uh, I've got different types of uh, scratch pins. You know, some four by eights by eight. And then uh, I also have some inside facilities because here in the desert, you know, the heat gets so damn bad and the wind, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have a swamp cooler set up inside, you know, 15 wow. fly pins where, you know, if the wind's real bad, I can bring them in. Uh, you know, I've spent a lot of money on the uh, good facilities and I think that you have to have, you know, be set up with uh, uh, good facilities to your, your best ability before you even get the chickens. That's right. And it doesn't have to be no. fancy. It just has to be right. Clean. Well, I mean, just keep it clean. You know, I mean, right. everybody, everybody starts out on the bottom. You know, we, we start out with five or 10 pins, and, you know, and then next thing you know, we got 300. You know, the biggest thing is don't overcrowd. Keep your pins clean. You know, keep, like you say, fresh water, good shade for your roosters, you know, especially you know, here where I'm at. Uh, plant trees, you know, just do any, anything that you can do to help them out. Um, you know, makes, it might make the difference when you need him to peck, you know. That's you know, right. I mean, you could be at the Golden Rooster going for the whole thing, and, and you, you know, you're calling on him, but if there's nothing to call on, you know. That's right. That's 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 what all those small details are. Those days where you 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 want to skip because you don't feel like it, or you know you you're not sure you done did already watered three or four hundred, but you forgot the ten over exactly. there. You know you can say, ah, I ain't gonna kill them. The, the, you know I can I can water them tomorrow. Yeah. Nah, you need to go back and water them now. I don't care how tired you are, you need to go and water them right. now. Because the, the here's the, here's the bottom line. If you don't, your opponent is. That makes mm -hmm. the difference, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. if, you, if you're slacking, you're partying on Friday and Saturday night. I'm hell. I'm in the bed by, you know. As soon as this interview's over, I'm going to bed. You know. <laughs> you know, it's uh, you know, just and 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 you know, I, I like to say, you know, the a, a working man or something that has to work from nine to five. Um, roosters, they they learn a schedule. Whatever schedule you put them on, if you feed it. Six o'clock, you know, after you get home from work or whatever the case may be, be there at six o'clock for them, you know, because believe it or not, that son of a bitch can tell time, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean, just keep them on a regular schedule and you'll do well, you know. You don't have to uh, be there with them all day long. It's nice and, and great if you can, but I think that if you get a, a good schedule, you know, and, and then keeping your roosters used to it, they're going to perform better for you. That's right. That's and the schedule is very, very important. And, and Clark, just emphasize to them 
uh, uh, how important that schedule is because I know we talked about it the other day, and like you were saying about putting them on that schedule. Uh -huh. If you have them on that schedule, okay, say you're in Mexico and you and you're and you're showing say in the afternoon or the evening yeah. time, um, and, and knowing that your birds are on a schedule. Do you adjust that schedule? Because I remember you saying that, hey, you know, if that bird used to eat at 6 o'clock, if he's over there and it's 6 o'clock, he's going to be ready to I eat. feed my roosters at 4 o'clock every day. I don't care if I'm in Mexico, Philippines, or wherever. I keep him on that same schedule, you know, and then, like I say, they perform real well for me, you know. Um, right. I'm a big believer that he can tell time, so. That's right. That's right. Well, you can, you can kind of tell – when you go out there around that well, time, the way yeah, they act, you already know. They know they're they're hungry. They, they know when it's time to eat, you know? That's so. right. That's right. So, Clark, so so since you have the indoor setup, outdoor setup, what type of uh, bedding do you like in, in, in saying your fly well, pens? In, the, in, in, on the inside of my fly pens, I use uh, half horse manure and then half of uh, – um, it's like that uh, potting soil from uh, Walmart that you get in the three by three cubes. In the right. desert, the, the moisture is, I mean, it just gets so dusty and everything where I'm at. Uh, I use the half horse manure and half uh, the potting soil, and it keeps, you know, it, it, it holds moisture more. You know, I mean, well, wow. that's what it's made for, you know. So, you know, it's real good for the rooster's feet. And you know it holds the moisture that I want to keep because you know it's 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 super dry here in the desert. That's right. That's right. That's right. So in your pens, you use the half of the potting soil and half of the manure, right. huh? Right. And then out in my scratch pens, you know, we'll uh, corn shucks when it's in season, but mo mainly it's mm -hmm. straw. You know, and then I like to keep the dirt good and soft for them. And you know, I mean, it's just uh, you know it it. it, it you know, when a rooster's flying up and down from six or seven or eight feet, you know, he needs a good spot to land on. You know, it's going to mess his feet up. They get bumblefoot or whatever the case may be, you know. That's right. That's right. So, so, okay. So, so going on. So, Clark, do you, do you first use pre-mix or you mix your own feed? Well, my feed is uh, mixed, but it's, um, I made up my own mix, you know, but the feed store, luckily, you know, I buy so much feed, I can't hardly mix it myself, but uh, I send him a list of what I need, and actually, we sat down with each other, because he's got, like, a formula that he makes up for the, you know, for the feeds, and uh, I usually like to feed about 16% out of my yard. I don't never feed above 16%. I feed 16% year-round, but, you know, like I say, in other locations where it gets a lot colder here, uh, you might need to add some cracked corn or, or uh, whole corn, because I use nothing but uh, cracked corn here you know, in my mix, but, uh, uh, they mix it, but it's my mix. It's your, yeah, it's your formula. They just do yeah, the mixing. Yeah. And, and say that again. So you use crack corn more so. Yeah, I don't, corn. I don't feed whole corn here. Cause even in the winter time here, uh, you know, it's 60 degrees, you know, so a rooster right. when it's hot, you'll notice he, he, he won't eat the whole kernel corn. He'll eat everything else, but he won't, you know, he, they just don't like, they just don't want the corn when it's hot. Cause it generates a lot of heat, you know? And, and so you can, basically feed the same feed all year. Yeah, I feed the same feed all year. I mean, even in my keep, there's a lot of people, you know, that like to mix up their uh, uh, feed during the, you know, uh, the keep. Anytime you change a rooster's feed, it throws him off. It takes him two or three weeks to get used to whatever you're feeding him. So if you got a rooster up for a three-week keep, you know, you've already got him, you know, going in the wrong direction. You know, I mean, I'll add a little bit of stuff to it, maybe a little fruits or something like that. Uh, just right. to keep moisture and stuff to them, but I always feed the same feed. Always feed the same feed. Now, 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 Clark, do you ever feed wet or dry or always? Well, I mean, you got to go by your weather. I mean, even here in the wintertime, I have to feed different than I do during the warmer months. Um, I mean, like I say, it just depends on where you're at, what you're what the weather's looking like. I mean, I'm all, hell, sometimes I look at my weather on my phone like eight or ten times a day, you know, just seeing right. what the, 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 the weather's looking like. But, you know, if it's rain, you know, rain, a lot of rain in the forecast, I may feed them a little drier. If it's, you know, if it's uh, uh, super dry, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll lay the buttermilk to them, you know. But, uh, okay. You know, it just depends. You just got to watch the weather. I mean, a rooster is a, you know, is a barometer, 
you know, pretty much. And, you know, he, he knows when right. the fronts are coming in and, and, and so on. So you pretty much you watch the weather, and it's always worked out good for me. Right. So, so, so tell me, Clark, uh, you know, I want to kind of get back to something you said earlier about the little fine details uh -huh. um, that, that is actually separating, you know, the guys with success versus the guys who still hunting the success. Right. You know, what, what, what are some of the fine little things that you see guys kind of overlook that you feel at the end of the day or at the end of the season, those percentages kind of relied on those things that either a person did or didn't do? Well, I mean, there, that's a lot. There's a lot of details in, you know, your question. Um, like I say, the bloodline in the beginning, you know, like I say, the brood pens are, is, is the heart of the farm, you know. Um, mainly just the, just those little details, like you're saying, clean water and clean pens and having – if you got a healthy rooster that's uh, tucked well care of, he's got good clean water and, and, and good feed, he's going to perform for you. You know, I mean, regardless of whether you know anything about a rooster or not, you know, uh, if you take good care of him, I think you get what you, you, you know, what you put in, you know, and that, that's, that's probably, I mean, that's as good as, you know, I know how to say it, you know. That's right. That's right. That's right. And I, and I think actually that's probably the best way because it's, it's, you know, you don't want to oversimplify it, but it ain't that right. Common, um, just you use know, a little if bit. You keep it kind of if you use common sense in this game, it'll take you a long ways. I mean, everybody's trying to think there's some miracle drug out there or something that you can give them. It's going to make him, you know, perform better, or, or you know, it's going to break him, make him break higher, or whatever the case may be. You can just go ahead and forget that right now. You know, <laughs> it's, it's hard work and dedication. What you know. What wins in this game, you know? I mean, that's uh, that separates the men from the boys. And I don't know if you can see that sign behind me or not, but you know, you, you, it says dream, you know, and you, know, you just you got to work hard for your dreams. That's right. That that is that is the that's the God's honest uh -huh. truth. It takes a lot of hard work. Every guest that we have had on prior to you said the same yeah, thing. Hey. It just takes a lot of – it takes work. Yeah. It's, it, 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 there's no shortcuts to it. You know, there's no miracle drugs. No. And everybody said the same thing. If you got a healthy, strong bird that's been taken care of his whole uh -huh. life, he's going to give you the best of his genetics, yes, period. Yep. I mean, that's, that, that's the bottom line. There's nothing else. I mean, for beginners or seniors or whoever the case may be, you cannot supplement – Every 365 days a year. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's exactly right. So, so Clark, what would you say um, the biggest difference from local to international competition well, as far as not just the, 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 the competition itself, but as far as the part that you're responsible for or that you have to adjust to as far as the – well, I mean, it's, here's the here's the biggest thing. Everybody asks me, like, you know, what's it like in the Philippines or what's it like in Mexico? The biggest advice I can give people is you need to go watch the local. You know, you need to watch the the man that's already in the trenches. You know, uh, uh, like I say, uh, one just one little um, example. You know, when I first went to the Philippines, you know, I mean, I, I trained you know, roosters the way that I'm used to training, you know, as soon as their feet hits the ground, boom, you know, they take off like a rocket, you know, that, that don't work right. over there, you know, because they train their roosters from very early and they breed really in smart, intelligent roosters. He's going to sidestep the hell out of you and just make you look stupid. And I think I do like wow. three or four in a row, you know, and then I just, you know, I, I went back to my room crying in my pillow and everything and, <laughs> you know, and then, then I, the next morning, you know, I just sit back and I was like, look, you know, I mean, you got to watch the local, uh, you know, the, the people that's already there at the pits, the people that's performing well, and then, you know, kind of join in, you know, and then start, you know, cultivating your own ideals and your own key mm -hmm. to fit what you need, you know, for, for that certain weapon in that, in that country. You know, that, that, that's, I think, extremely valuable information. And one of the reasons I say that, is because uh, we talked about it on, I think it was with Mark, yeah, Mark Muggs, when we talked about, you know, how a lot of guys set back from the internet uh -huh. and was criticizing a lot of those guys that was, you know, uh, 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 you know, competing uh -huh. in Mexico. And to me, it's just unfair uh -huh. because it's almost like sitting back 
watching a boxing match and then saying, man, why he didn't block that? He could have ducked that. Why he didn't throw a jab? Man, it's not that easy. It's not that easy. All I can say to those guys is just come get you some. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Talk is cheap in this game. And, you know, if you let the talk, uh, uh, you know, interrupt you or – piss you off or, I mean, because people's going to say all kinds of things. And a lot of people's jealous in this game. You know, it's just, uh, you know, just stick to your game, do your deal, and don't worry about everybody else. You know, try to help the, try to help the people that's even been bad to you. You know, that's just, right. just, you know, that's continue right. to do what you're doing, you know, trying to make the sport better. And, and just like we're doing now, right. you know, just whatever it helps to, to this game, I'm down for it, you know. Yep. Yep, that that's you know, Clark, that's that is so extremely helpful, and you're a thousand percent correct. You know, guys don't realize that in order for this sport, to me, I just feel as though I'm just giving right. back. Because if this sport wasn't around, if it wasn't people like us prior to right. us that laid the groundwork that kept this sport around, yeah. we wouldn't have been able to have these this positive impact that we have on our life from these animals. Right. So I just feel as though it's your responsibility to give back something that you was given exactly. because you was given this opportunity to, to experience these things. Nobody uh, goes, you know, you don't make it to the top without a lot of people helping you. You know I mean? Like I say, I've got so many people that's helped me out along, you know, whether it's been good information or bad information, you know, I mean, you just, you got to take the goods with the bads and there's just so many good people out there, you know, that I could never think enough, you know, to get, you know, to put me in the spot where I am, you know, I just, uh, I, I thank God, you know, and then, you know, he's right. put me in a great position and, 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 you know, introduced me to a lot of uh, real good people. You know, it's helped me along the mm-hmm. way. You know, Clark, that's, that's I mean, and, and like I say, I know I thank you already enough, but I'll thank you again. I really, really appreciate you coming on and, and, and just spreading that information because, again, I just feel as though if somebody, we're laying the groundwork for the next generation right. for this sport to be yes. here. And I feel as though... The more people we educate, the better it is for the sport. The better they take care of birds, the better they make breeding decisions, the better they can travel. You know, every all the information that we give out there right. is only going to improve the sport. And like you said, you got to kind of dig through some of the information and, and cater it to your situation. Right. I understand that. But I think the the tight lip, the tight lip holding back information, to me, that's like, is just so selfish, and I don't think it's good for the right. sport. And if you're only winning because you got that little secret and the next man right. don't, well, I this is the whole reason this was created, this whole journey to the pit. So eventually, yeah. you're not going to be able to win because you got that one little uh-huh. secret. Because you know what? We're going to be putting out a mass amount of information, good quality time-tested information yeah. that you're not just going to be able to get away with winning because your competition is so uneducated. Uh-huh. Well, I mean, just like I say, I have a lot of people, you know, that texts me on uh, Facebook private, you know, uh, or Messenger, and, you know, that I don't even know them. And, you know, like I say, I just try to help them out, you know, with my experiences. And, you know, I mean, like I say, it, it, I just can't stress enough, you know, how many, you know, people has helped me along the way. So just giving a little bit back is, uh, you know, uh, the best part of the game. You know, and, I, and, and, and the best part about this game anyway is uh, the people that you meet, you know, the, the friends that you make. I mean, I've got, like, you know, uh, brothers in the Philippines, brothers in Mexico, you know, all over the United States. You know, it's just, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there that, you know, that uh, I really love and, and thank God I got to meet. That is uh, that is totally correct, and I think uh, it is one of the things I said like some time ago. It's all to me about the journey, not just the destination. Right. You know, it, 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 and that's where the whole lifestyle is created. Uh-huh. It's through the right. journey, not just the destination. Not when you get in that box or get in that circle. Mm-hmm. That's just the destination. When you really sit back and think about it, your whole life experiences was all about that journey, just getting up to that yes, box. Sir. And that's going to kind of make or break you in the sport. That's the things that you're going to re- – you're going to also remember what happened in that box or in that yeah. circle. But what you want to remember more is all of those friends, those experiences, those memories, and all the mistakes and the good things that you have done up until right. then. So, so 
I want to just talk a little bit about, again, about the international travel. It's funny that you say uh, that, you know, being successful, you know, stateside and, and, and thinking you was able to take the same techniques and tactics to the Philippines, <laughs> you, you kind of learned real quick that that wasn't going to no, work. No, I mean, I learned that really, really quick over there. And, you know, I think that's a lot of Americans' problems. You know, we, we, we at one time we was number one, but – Right. Now we're not, you know, I mean, so, I mean, just in the Philippines, I mean, they fight every single day. There's big coliseums all around, you know, every town that you go to, there's four or five places to go to. They fight millions of roosters a year. I mean, here we can't even do it. So, you know, mm -hmm. even, even if you do, you know, you, how can you compete with guys that's, you know, I, I go over there and, 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 and you know, they, they, they do the interviews in the open. You've got congressmen, doctors, lawyers, you know, that, that, that are to fight every single day, and they've got 20 or 30 people working for them. And, you, yeah, I mean, all the bloodlines that they have, you know, pretty much come from the states. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, mm -hmm. their, their weapon is completely different. Their culture is different. You know, and you just got to mm -hmm. kind of embrace that, you know. And then once you start figuring out, okay, this might work a little bit better or, you know, you're all putting your own little tweaks to it. And then, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we've been super successful over there, too. That's right. That that's And, and, and I think uh, uh, that was important to say because, again, that just goes back to guys just sitting at home, you know, 5,000 miles away uh, and not realizing that you can't just go over there and do what you're doing, you know. And, and, and you lived it. You lived it. You went over there with the same successful tactics and techniques that you had one with time and time and time right. again. And went over there and just got crushed. Yeah. And, 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 you know, like I say, you just got to regroup from that, you know, figure out what you've done wrong and go back and try to give it to them again. But, uh, you know, uh, the ears is the most important thing. You know, listening, right. Right. you know, uh, from, you know, people that's going to give you good advice. And, um, you know, you just, you'll put two and two together, you know, eventually. Mm -hmm. So, so do you do you think that it is it, so? Basically, what you're saying, it is some things that we can probably use when we travel internationally. But also, uh, probably our biggest focus, instead of us coming in the door saying that how we can do something right. better, we might need to just sit back and see how it's being yeah. done and why it's being done. Yeah, I mean, way. just I mean, you take like this gaff derby, you know, they had in Mexico. You know, uh, I mean, you look at the distance people have to travel to get from here to there. You know, to, to ship in the roosters. I mean, it takes so much, you know, time. Uh, it takes friends. It takes, you know, I mean, it's just so much stuff that has to go, you know, bang, bang, bang before, you know, when you get. And go from there. So, can you hear me? No, that, that's, that's, I think the video kind of conked out a little bit, but I think the video kind of froze up a little bit. I didn't know if you can get the phone call. But, but, but that's, that, I think those, those, okay, I, I think, you know, like you were saying, I think it's very, very important um, that they know that, like you said, the ears, is is probably one of the most important things to go there look listen and learn first before you think you can walk in the door making a mark 